Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about the Typhoon class submarine. I'd heard of this, uh, it's like the biggest submarine ever built. It's an insane project. I think it has a swimming pool inside, stuff like that. Anyway, we're gonna jump into it, so let's get started. In the frigid depths below the Arctic Circle, a monster glides effortlessly through the dark water, an object larger than anything ever seen below the waves. I mean, oh, how big is a whale compared to a submarine? Six times longer than a blue whale. <laughs> there we go. And on to the teeth, with the kind of weaponry that leads to only one thing nuclear war. What first appeared in the 1970s is almost gone now, but it still retains its hallowed status as the largest submarine ever put to sea, and by some distance. The Soviets named it the Akula class, meaning shark. But we know it better by the name given to it by NATO, the Typhoon class submarine. I feel like NATO should have just translated it directly from shark. The shark submarine would have been, you know, cooler. What rolled out of the Severodvinsk shipyard in 1979 was quite simply a different level. The Typhoon-class submarine had been designed as a direct challenger to the Ohio class of the United States. This was at the height of the Cold War, with both sides frantically attempting to match each other in every possible way. And we've talked about this in previous mega projects. Just the amount of innovation that came out of the Cold War in terms of like ways to kill each other, but also cool technology related to ways to kill each other. Pretty extraordinary. The Typhoon-class submarine came to public prominence in the West, at least, thanks to the 1984 book and 1990 film The Hunt for Red October, in which a brooding Soviet captain, played wonderfully by Sean Connery, goes rogue. And that is a fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it, recommend it. And people often make fun of me for having seen no classic movies. I have seen The Hunt for Red October. It's great. Is he defecting or does he have his sights set on the destruction of the American East Coast? I'm not going to give you any more details. It's worth a watch, not only as an excellent film, but as an insight into what life must have been like on board a Typhoon class submarine. While the Soviets had, of course, kept much of the mechanical systems well under wraps, they also wanted the world to know it existed. This was all part of the psychological warfare of it. The Hunt for Red October introduced the wider public to these fearsome monsters for the first time. So let's take a look at the submarine itself. First of all, it was enormous. At 175 meters, 574 feet, it is only slightly longer than its American counterpart. While the width or beam, as nautical folk like to refer to it, is 23 meters, 75 feet, compared to just 13 meters, 42 feet on the Ohio class. You might not think that 10 meters makes much of a difference, but it really, really does. It can sometimes be difficult to compare these submarines simply by looking at their length or their beam, so we often focus on water displacement. This is the amount of water that the submarine effectively replaces when it is submerged. Imagine, you know, putting it in a big, really big swimming pool. All the water that flows over the side is essentially the size of your submarine. And this, this is where the Typhoon class stands head and shoulders above anything else. At a colossal 48,000 tons, it has a displacement of two and a half times the Ohio class. 10 meters difference, two and a half times the water displacement. It was huge. So why did the Soviet Union need such a vast leviathan of a submarine? I'm gonna guess here that it was to show off. Well, there are two main reasons. We're going to go into the weapons carried on board in more detail shortly, but let me start by saying that the missiles carried were significantly bigger than those of the Americans. Their power was roughly the same, but American engineering was ahead, at least in how compact they could make a nuclear bomb. The Typhoon-class submarine needed to be enormous in order to accommodate the enormous bombs on board. Simple maths, really. The second reason was far less practical and certainly more ego-driven. This may have been secondary to the capacity needed, but no doubt Soviet leaders rather enjoyed the fact that this submarine was bigger than anything ever created. The Cold War game of cat and mouse it does have a lot of intriguing aspects to it, but simple prestige played a huge role. Anyone familiar with the space race will know that. Today, only one Typhoon-class submarine, the Dmitry Donskoy, remains in active duty. This was also the very first to be built and currently operates as a test platform for the more modern Beluva missiles. Two further Typhoons, the Arkhangelsk and the Severstal, have been held in reserve for the last 15 years.
Ok, so present day out of the way, let's jump back to the start. The Soviet Union had fallen slightly behind in terms of submarines in the Cold War. The introduction of the Ohio class submarine in the late 70s at a reported cost of $2 billion, adjusted for inflation, was a significant turning point for nuclear submarines. This was not a submarine designed to wage battle beneath the waves, rather, this was a ballistic missile submarine capable of single-handedly wiping nations off the face of the earth. They were a fearsome rival, and didn't Soviets know it? At the time, the Soviets relied heavily on the Delta-class submarines. Though they would have been the envy of almost every nation around the world, the Soviets knew that they had to keep up with the Americans. Records from the Soviet Union are always sketchy at best, but when it came to the production of weaponry, it remains a closely guarded secret. We believe it was 1979 when the first Typhoon-class submarine left the shipyard to begin live testing, and it was officially commissioned in 1981. Much of what the Typhoons did with their time, we'll simply never know, because it's classified and just remains that way. Anyway, perhaps luckily for everybody, the 1980s saw the beginning of the end of the Cold War. The days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world apparently teetered on the edge of nuclear war, were thankfully long gone. While both the Soviets and the Americans still needed to strut their stuff and flex their mighty muscles every now and again, change was in the air. In 1986, at the Reykjavik summit, US President Ronald Reagan and his Soviet counterpart Mikhail Gorbachev began a series of steps that would limit the number of nuclear weapons held in both countries. On the 31st of July 1991, they signed the START-1 treaty, limiting both countries to only 6,000 nuclear warheads atop a maximum of 1,600 intercontinental missiles. Now let's be really clear here, that's still enough missiles to destroy the world many times over, but you know, I guess it was the symbolism that counted, and you know, one less nuclear missile is still a good thing. <laughs> Just under five months later, on December the 25th, 1991, you probably know what happens. The Soviet Union was officially dissolved. So, what did this mean for these dreadnoughts of the seas? Well, at first, really little. As the new Russia stepped forward, it needed to retain its impressive submarines. But it quickly became apparent that the need for such submarines was actually coming to an end. One slightly odd fact about the Arms Reductions Treaties was that when the first typhoon was withdrawn from duty in 1991 and scrapped shortly thereafter, it was done so with the financial aid of the United States. Yep, Russia's old foe was now effectively paying to help remove its most terrifying weaponry. And I guess, you know, kind of money well spent there, isn't it? <laughs> The Shark or Typhoon was a submarine that could remain submerged for 120 days and even longer when absolutely necessary. Just nuclear submarines are seriously cool, right? But despite its girth, life was still cramped within this metal shell. There were, however, some surprising additions. Please, let's talk about the inside swimming pool. I really think it, or like this, it was like a plunge pool or something. They had additions that would make these long dives a bit more manageable. Each submarine came with a small swimming pool, sauna, and gym, and when I say a swimming pool, I really mean a two meter long pool, so you're not really doing any laps in it. But plunging into cold water after a sauna has always been a much loved Russian tradition. So, well, why not? Unlike most other submarines, the Typhoon class had two central pressurized hulls instead of just one, with three smaller above them. One for the torpedo room at the front, one in the middle for the control room, and one at the back for the rudder machinery. The two main pressurized hulls were a unique design, and each housed one reactor and one turbine, which would enable the submarine to continue operating if one hull was compromised and needed to be locked down. But this was a design forced upon them by the vast size of the missiles that were to be carried. It would have been simply impossible for a Delta-class submarine to carry what the Typhoons did. It certainly was a big boy, but its size really wasn't what NATO was worried about when this submarine appeared. As I said earlier, this was a ballistic missile submarine, not particularly fast, not particularly agile. It wasn't the attack class submarines that both the Soviets and the Americans were using. While it certainly had the capability to defend itself if attacked underwater, its primary use was to act as a mobile nuclear launch pad capable of punching through thick ice firing its missiles off quickly before disappearing again with little trace. 
Now, I've spoken a lot about the size of this submarine, and much of it is because of the 20 R-39s, known to NATO as the SSN-20 Sturgeon missiles, each which had 10 nuclear warheads. This was an intercontinental missile with a fearsome reputation, weighing 75 tons each, with a length of 16 meters and a diameter of 2.4 meters, 7.9 feet. You begin to understand why this was the biggest submarine ever constructed. There are 10 of these 75-ton missiles on board with 10 nuclear warheads in them. It's, it's absurd. These missiles had a range of 5,200 miles, 8,300 kilometers, and had a blast yield of between 100 and 200 kilotons. Each warhead alone was 5 to 10 times more powerful than what was dropped on Nagasaki at the end of World War II, and there were 200 of them. Now, if you know, Ending the world wasn't enough. It also came with six torpedo tubes with a casual 22 torpedoes on the submarine if underwater combat was required. I do feel it'd be like, hey guys, stop attacking me or I will blow up the world. Now, not only did these submarines carry an arsenal capable of destroying significant portions of the world, the engines themselves were nuclear. The Typhoon-class submarines ran on two OK-659VV OK pressurized nuclear reactors using 20 to 45 percent enriched uranium, which in turn powered two VV-type steam engines, which could each produce 37 megawatts power. This total of 74 megawatts would be enough to power 7,400 homes in New York City. The submarine could travel at a reported maximum speed of 22.22 knots, or 25.57 miles per hour, or 41.15 kilometers an hour while on the surface, and 27 knots, 31 miles per hour, 50 kilometers per hour when submerged. Now I say these numbers are reported because official speeds have never been released by the Soviets or later the Russians, of course, they remain classified just like everything else. But if these are roughly accurate, it would make it slightly faster than the American Ohio-class submarines. There's one story in particular involving a Typhoon submarine that has almost passed into legend at this point, but it remains frustratingly underreported. In September 1991, TK-17, known as Arkhangelsk, was ordered to execute a test launch of one of its R-39s without the nuclear weapons, of course. Captain Igor Grishkov ordered his submarine into the White Sea, close to the Finnish border, and set coordinates for a target thousands of miles away on the Chukotka Peninsula. This was nothing more than a routine maneuver, and one that this submarine had done many times before. As the countdown reached one, it's fair to assume that nobody on board had any inkling as to what was about to happen. Instead of the swoosh of a missile soaring to the surface, they were greeted with the worst possible noise a submariner can hear. An explosion rocked the submarine. Alarms began blaring frantically. Now, you don't need me to tell you that being on board a submerged submarine after an explosion must be pretty hellish. Doing so while also carrying two nuclear reactors and live nuclear warheads, a whole lot of them, would not only be catastrophic for the crew, it could also spell doom for the surrounding area. Captain Grishkov ordered the ballast tanks be blown, an emergency system that shoots the submarine quickly to the surface. At this point, the full damage was not known, but after surfacing, the crew were able to assess the carnage simply by looking down into the submarine from the open hatch. And it wasn't a pretty sight. Several fires were raging towards the bow, unfortunately exactly where the other 19 R-39 still sat. Instead of launching, the missile had partially exploded within its tube, and its rocket fuel was quickly spreading across the surface of the boat. Now, at this point, spare a thought for Captain Grishkov. You have a closely guarded state secret under your control, which is now on fire. Flames that were quickly moving towards the nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons on board. It wasn't clear how many had died already, but the fate of the 160 men who remained lay in his hands, along with the unimaginable fear of several nuclear explosions. His actions that day remained some of the most courageous and quick thinking by any captain you're likely to ever see. With a gaping hole in their submarine, you'd think that the worst possible course of action would be to dive. I mean, if you punch a hole in a heavy object and put it in water, it's gonna sink. But Captain Grishkov, he was thinking differently. To the disbelief of the crew, he ordered the submarine dive once again and warned those in the front hull to expect flooding. With extraordinary skill and courage, the crew of the submarine carried out his order perfectly and guided the stricken submarine beneath the surface once again. 
when the submarine resurfaced moments later. The fires had been extinguished. Still in serious danger, as the Arkhangelsk managed to limp home and the threat of nuclear disaster eventually disappeared. Many throughout the Soviet Navy felt Captain Grishkov should be commended for his extraordinary quick thinking, but he never was. This was a very politically sensitive time in the Soviet Union, coming just a month after the failed coup against Mikhail Gorbachev. The missile test had been planned to demonstrate an air of normality, but such a close call was not the kind of event that the Soviets wished to publicize, and it was quickly swept under the carpet. Captain Igor Grishkov died in 2018, aged 67, his heroic action still shrouded in secrecy. So, we know that one of these Titans remains in active service, but have we seen the last of this type of mega submarine? This is, of course, pretty difficult to predict, but right now it seems pretty unlikely. The Typhoon class submarines were designed to carry the kind of weapons that just don't exist anymore. Nuclear missiles are significantly more compact, so something of that size doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, there's also, I mean, there's also less of a dick measuring contest going on because there's, you know, not the Cold War anymore. Yes, the Soviets needed something to carry around that amount of weaponry, but as we said earlier, kind of the title of largest submarine in the world was a pretty big draw to them. But the reality is we've moved from the age of enormous weaponry to something much more discreet, where stealth and speed is a lot more important than size. The Typhoon-class submarines may have entered the world at the only time when the technology and political drive was there to do so. Another reason they began to fall out of favor was the huge costs associated not just with building them, but with general upkeep. Their replacement, the Borai-class submarines, cost about half as much and still pack a hell of a punch. In recent years, murmurs have emanated from the Kremlin about refitting the Dmitry Donskov for modern use, but this remains to be seen. The days of the Typhoon class might soon be over, and we may never see the likes of it again. If you can forget the fact that they were essentially designed to destroy the world, we can only marvel at such creations. War has this habit of pushing humanity to unimaginable heights, and what lurked menacingly deep in the oceans during the 80s and 90s in particular was exactly that. So I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Mega Projects. If you did, please do smash that like button below. And don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos twice per week at the moment. And your suggestions are welcome below. And thank you for watching.